Okay, I think we will like to start after lunch uh, and welcome everyone back. Um, I'm here together with Yao. We are going to host and moderate this next uh, panel. And the third panel is focused uh, on processes, where the other ones have been on place and site. And I'm quite sure that there will be a lot of interlinks between what we have already discussed and what we will also discuss now. Um, but hopefully also we maybe will move more into methods uh, and discussion about methodological challenges or possibilities. So, good afternoon and thank you. Thank you to, to, the, to the organization, to Scopio, to FAUP for this great opportunity. Um, we'll start um, with an online presentation made by uh, Ciro Miguel that you already can see. Hello, Ciro. Um, Ciro is a Brazilian architect, photographer, and doctoral fellow of the Institute for History and Theory of Architecture at the ETH Zurich. He holds a professional diploma from the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and a master's degree from Columbia's in, uh, Columbia University. He was co-curator of Todo Dia, Every Day, uh, the 12th uh, International Architecture Biennale of Sao Paulo in 2019, and in 2022, he co-edited the book Everyday Matters, uh, Contemporary Approach to Architecture by Ruby Press. So, welcome, Ciro, and, well, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, okay. yes. Perfect. Okay, so let me organize here. So you can see my screen also already, the ectochrome color. Yes, it's up. It's being projected. Yeah, okay, great. okay. So thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here in Porto, taking part of the Landscapes of Care conference. Unfortunately, online uh, as a giant talking head in the room. Um, so I will jump already for uh, the presentation, which is part of my, uh, it's a fragment of my thesis. Uh, that is entitled The Architecture of Brasilia Through the Lens of Photojournalism from uh, 1957 to 1960. Um, <clears throat> as part of the government's propaganda to promote the new capital Brasilia, North American writer Elizabeth Bishop was invited to visit the construction site in 1958. Even though some of the completed buildings fascinated Bishop, her overall description was grim. Quote, the place had been described to me, but I was not prepared for such dreariness and desolation. One's first and last impression of Brasilia was miles and miles and miles of blowing red dust. As the floating dust spread over Brasilia's construction site, it also filled the printed pages of newspapers and magazines. For critics of the new capital, the dust was a vessel of their anxieties, described as a threat to health and maintenance. For supporters, the dust was fundamental and its dirtiness represented the efforts of a new country under construction. For President Juscelino Kubitschek, the dust was a metaphor for a more democratic future, hovering above all and leveling social extremes. For builders covered in dust, builders covered in dust, it was a daily concern that worsened the working conditions. For opportunistic salesmen, it was a merchandise sold in bottles to tourists. This presentation discusses how dust tainted the representation of Brasilia. As the, moders, as the modern, modernist architecture confronted the landscape, dust introduced a distortion in its pure image, threatening not only the whiteness of the buildings, but also contaminating the surfaces of drawings, cameras, lenses, printed photographs, clothes, and lungs on the construction site. While most of the architectural black and white photos of Brasilia produced clean images, the introduction of the newest color film, Ectachrome, by photojournalists made earthworks and dust visible. With their exaggerated color reproduction, these new images enhanced the perception of Brasilia's impact on the environment. If dust is, according to Richard Meyer, an environment in miniature, a physical archive of our material surroundings, 
This, art, this presentation analyzes how these fine particles of solid matter and their accidental reproduction operated as visual dissonances that confuse the modern distinction between nature and culture. The vibrant green of a few photographs found in the public archive of Brasilia captured by photojournalist Mario Fontanelli around 1956 showcase the savanna-like landscape prior to Brasilia's construction. The original colorful photos found in the archive provide a vivid depiction of the so-called Cerrado, a rich biome that occupies a vast area of Brazil's central plateau, encompassing a complex fauna and flora, indigenous populations, and quilombos, which are settlements of Afro-Brazilian slave descendants. Following three centuries of failed attempts to occupy and exploit these vast continent continental lands by the European colonial powers, a young independent Brazil decided to build a new capital in its geographic center and connect it to the rest of the country with roads. Brasilia was an architectural wonder designed from scratch to be the symbol of a larger modernization plan to finally conquer this territory, bringing civilization to the wilderness. The so-called city of the future appropriated was presumed to be empty land. On many instances, the existing landscape was mostly referred to as desert, devoid of history. The urbanist Lucio Costa, author of Brasilia's pilot plan competition, wrote, the truth is that Brasilia exists where a few years ago there was only desert and loneliness. Oscar Niemeyer, the architect responsible for all buildings, uh, wrote, it was a huge desert lost on the central plateau. Lastly, President Juscelino Kubitschek followed the same view. Only the desert flatness existed in that region. The erasure was not only symbolic, but also physical. In just a few hours of 1957, hundreds of bulldozers performed colossal earthworks and massive clearings assigned to carve the delicate lines of Lucio Costa's urban plan to the ground. Suddenly, the original vegetation was removed bringing to the surface layers of red dust and of red soil and clouds of dust. This episode of environmental disruption constituted the first of many mass media events choreographed to be captured by photojournalists. While many written accounts, um, newspaper articles and oral histories refer to the impacts of the red dust, the dust itself and the exposed red soil was hardly visible. This was due to the fact that during Brazilia's construction, architectural publications, newspapers, and televisions continued to transmit images mostly in black and white. Color was exclu exclusive to illustrated magazines. With the introduction of Kodak at the Chrome in the mid 40s, a faster workflow, vibrant colors, and crisp resolution made it, made it the preferred film for popular magazines, photo agencies, and photojournalists working in far off places around the world. Following the assumption by photography theorist Ariela Zulai that the camera makes destruction acceptable, in the case of Brasilia, ectachrome film magnified the greedy and dusty facet of modern modernity by rendering it discernible. Because black and white images converted the reds and greens of the transformed landscape into shades of gray, they effectively concealed the impact of the earthworks. With this technology available, Brasilia's red soil was made of was made public, was made available to the wider public on illustrated magazine Manchete in 1958. These first ever color reproductions of Brasilia's architecture on the, on the making were an important milestone for the government's propaganda campaign for the capital transfer. For Manchete, the seducing images were intended to capture readers' imagination and sell magazines. The appearance of the red color, a result of the printing technique, emphasized the perception of a lifeless environment. When combined with the building's unprecedented shapes, this visually ignited the reader's imagination of a futuristic city being built atop of an existing dusty desert by a pharaoh like president. When the first buildings were completed in 1958, the ever-present red dust became a threat to the architecture itself, contaminating the building's pristine white appearance. If the white wall was, if the white wall was associated with modern architecture, order, and hygiene, Red dust was anti-modern, chaotic, and dirty. With red dust covering its surfaces, Brasilia failed to live up to the ambitions of to being a symbol of modernity and the taming of Brazil's central plateau. Brasilia in dust, 
complicated the clean distinctions between architecture and nature, between civilization and wilderness, order and disorder. While buildings had to be clean from dust, so were their photographic architectural representations. Although newspapers and illustrated magazines frequently denounced the city's dusty air, Marcel Godejo, commissioned by architect Oscar Niemeyer to document Brasilia's construction, produced impressively clear black and white photographs. Godejo's photos were never grainy and did not show any speckles of dust on their surfaces. Against the physical reality of the landscape, Godejo reinforced modernism, environmental purity, and, the mo and most of his Brasilia photographs became the preferred choice for architectural magazines, exhibitions, and books. To this day, they continue to illustrate most publications about Brasilia. Contrary to Godejo's work, the, photog the photographs of Brasilia's construction club published in mass circulation magazines were often dirty and grainy. Their richness in both black and white and color images resulted from the enlargement of 35 millimeter films, the cheap paper and occasional, occasional speckles of dust in the negatives that would appear on the printed surface. Rather than the artificially purified architectural images, these dirty pictures taken through the dusty lens of photojournalism function as evidence of the larger contingencies of modernity in Brazil. One day before the inauguration of Brasilia, the newspaper Tribuna da Imprensa published the headline, hours before the transfer, Brasilia is still dust. The article criticized the unfinished work, the high prices, the lack of electricity, and of course, the dust. According to the newspapers, uh, to the newspaper, Brasilia was taken over by violent clouds of dust that caused coughing and didn't allow anything to stay clean for more than a minute. Even the Congress building, originally white in design, was now red with so much dust. Hours before the opening ceremonies, an intense cleaning ballet was launched to get rid of the enduring presence of the red dust. Because the city and its buildings needed to be as white as possible for its major photographic event, an army of workers washed and swept the floors, ensuring that the city's whiteness, uh, ensuring that the appearance of cleanliness was maintained. A few images of the cleaning. After the destruction of the Second World War, there was a general demand for modernization, consumption, and purity. Hygiene became a redemptive effort, and to be clean meant to be a modern and remote nation. In Brazil, the main symbol of a new developed country were the white monuments of Brasilia. Promoted by the state, Brasilia buildings and their representations in official magazines and exhibitions were supposed to, be, to always appear dust-free, shine, and pristine. As such, both the architecture and the urban plan were designed apart from tropical nature. The Brasilia Palace Hotel, for instance, was elevated to minimize the contact with the landscape. Its photographic representation reinforced this hovering above the ground impression. When captured on black and white film, the columns painted black tended to disappear under the building's shadow, while the volume's white geometrical forms tended to be highlighted. This indifference to the immediate context translated the larger conceptual dualities that Brasilia project was based. Civilization versus wilderness. Regarding the urban plan, the author Lucio Costa commented in 1974, when I had the idea of positioning the three powers square, it was among other things with the aim of highlighting the contrast between the civilized part under control of Brazil and the wild nature of the Cerrado. Against all odds, the pernicious presence of the red dust, the buildings, uh, the Against all odds, the pernicious presence of the red dust in buildings and photojournalistic photographs failed to recognize this distinction, producing a hybrid condition that reinforced Bruno Latour's statement that we have never been modern. If post-war modernization promised development, cleaning, and Brazil's convergence onto the world stage, the dust seemed to taint the desired purification, serving as a constant reminder of modernity's unintended side effects. German philosopher Max Benz wrote in 1961 that the air in Brasilia is never just an element of breathing, it's also an element of perception. Invisible to official discourses of national progress, insistently swiped from architectural surfaces and removed from architectural photographs, the subversive presence of dust destabilized the timeless and autonomous images or image of modern architecture and planning. To perceive Brasilia through the fine grains of red dust is to realize that the city, after being built, could never be fully artificial or modern. That's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. We will just move on to the next speaker, and then we will have uh, the shared discussion in the end. Uh, and the next speaker is Kone Strothmann. See if he is here with us. Yes, he is. <laughs> hey. Um, I will just introduce Kone. Kone Strothmann is a landscape architect working as designer, artist, and educator. He is the co-founder of Collectif, urbanist and landscape architects in Holland, and has an artistic practice where he develops experimental projects on the fringe of archi landscape architecture, research, and filmmaking. Kone keeps lectures and teaching engagements at various institutions, amongst them ENSP in Versailles, where he integrates the use of film as a tool for landscape architecture in his teaching. So please, Kone, if you are ready with your presentation. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, I'll share my screen. If it goes well, you should see my presentation now. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. And also thanks for this previous presentation, which was incredibly interesting and quite hard to follow up, I guess. Um, yeah, like Rick said, I'm a, I'm a landscape architect. I work as a designer, teacher, and a sort of researcher slash experimental filmmaker. Um, in my paper and in this presentation, uh, uh, both sort of function as a as a reflection on one of my more recent projects, which is uh, a film and research project called This and the Custom, which revolves around uh, a, a Dutch horticultural landscape. Um, I will set up this presentation uh, in, in three parts. So in the beginning, I will lay out the context of why I uh, chose this as my topic why I went into this direction. The second part lays out a few of the conclusions of the film and of the research project. And then uh, I will go into uh, a few ways in which filmmaking helped me uh, reach those conclusions and those insights into this landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the main overarching topics of uh, getting into agricultural landscapes in general and horticulture in particular is the relationship between food production and the cl climate crisis. Um, food production is one of the largest causes of global environmental change. It's responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of freshwater use. It's a large factor in species extinction, and it uh, massively deteriorates water quality. Uh, however, just downscaling agriculture is not an option, as about 800 million people do not have enough access to food as it is. Uh, and the world population is growing. So there's been a, a long and quite contentious debate on um, how to uh, produce enough food for everyone in the world, basically, and uh, at the same time become a, a more sustainable practice. Um, what is quite interesting about this debate is that it focuses mainly on different agricultural techniques uh, and less so on the spatial implications, spatial, systemic, and aesthetic implications of these techniques on our landscapes. Um, and I think we should discuss those impacts as agriculture takes up 50% of the inhabitable land mass, so our, the landscapes around us will be massively influenced by uh, implementation of new agricultural techniques. Um, lately, uh, a number of architects have gotten involved in uh, in the larger discourse on, on sustainable agriculture, uh, most notably uh, AMO in their Guggenheim exhibition and uh, Sebastian Moreau in the Lisbon Triana. Uh, what I thought was interesting is that both take a position in the larger debate on techniques and don't really address the aesthetic and systemic impact of those techniques on existing landscapes. So uh, the starting point of my project was uh, to shift this debate to uh, include these impacts into the consider into the wider considerations that are going on. Um, the film was aimed to be, or still is aimed to be, the first in a series of studies of landscapes where uh, pioneering techniques of food production are applied, uh, as to get a glimpse of what uh, the world might look like if these techniques are applied more broadly. 
Uh, the film focuses on a, on a cluster of horticulture and agro-logistics businesses uh, near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, the final film is inspired by uh, a sort of loose genre called landscape film, which uh, gives a sort of open-ended interpretations of landscapes based on precise readings of those landscapes. Um, here's a few stills from the film. At the end of the presentation, there's a link to the entire video if you're interested in it. Um, given the time, it's uh, just stills for now. The film is a mix of sort of uh, uh, still wide angle images, uh, more panned close ups of, of textures and uh, movements. It includes uh, architectural model making as, as a method of study and representation. Uh, it has a, a caption running along, uh, including uh, uh, things from, from research and uh, uh, reports on the area. Um, yeah, here's just a few more images, also to give you an idea of how varied this landscape actually is. Yeah, so um, what this project and the making of this film got me, and what is partially also the message of the film, is that uh, our understanding of greenhouse horticulture as we use it is maybe not completely correct. Uh, it's generally understood as a, a closed controlled system with a monitored in and output. Um, and uh, the area or sort of the, the farmers behind this area intend to become more sustainable by just changing the inputs into the system. So you still have the climate controlled greenhouse, but uh, you get your heating from geothermal sources and you use CO2 from a local in industrial area instead of uh, using fertilizers. However, uh, as these images already show, uh, in practice, this, this system is not so closed as her cultural fertilizer gets into water systems, which is abundantly clear from the local fauna, which is very much influenced by this fertilizer. Um, I also realized that greenhouse systems are perhaps more close spatially than systemically, and that this is either an accidental convenience or almost on purpose by those uh, running the systems as uh, it prevents a more multifocal discourse on the sustainable development of the region. Uh, in short, it's very hard to see what goes on in the greenhouses. A lot of the infrastructures hidden underground are, as you could see in this previous picture, sort of hidden away in pragmatic boxes that don't really tell you anything about what's going on. And that makes it very hard to understand the functioning or to, you basically just have to take the farmers on their word that they are actually becoming more sustainable. Um, the project proposes to use the spaces in between the greenhouses as uh, uh, zones of interaction, to use these as places of interaction between uh, the horticultural processes and passerby stakeholders and experts in order to create a more um, uh, open and multivocal discourse on sustainability. The spaces can also be used uh, for planting to, that can regulate uh, the runoff between the greenhouses and lead to a more biodiverse ecosystem. Uh, overall, I think the development uh, of the non-agricultural spaces when implementing new agricultural techniques is key to create livable and sustainable landscapes. Um, I think filmmaking and the process of making the film very much influenced getting to these conclusions. Uh, of course, I'm not the first designer to, to work with film. It's used relatively often to communicate uh, designs and design approaches as well as to to annotate sites, visits, and experiences. But I think beyond that, filmmaking for me uh, was a way of engaging with and producing knowledge on the landscape that I was studying. Uh, this is something that uh, the American philosopher Ian Bogo calls uh, a philosophical carpentry, uh, which is a bit of a strange term, but he, he means it as uh, engaging with non-traditional methodologies of knowledge production for a discipline. And he argues that by using sort of unconventional methods, you create new insights and gather new information for a discipline, just merely because you do something from a different perspective or a different angle and you see different things and you require more reflection than you do when you do the, the same old, same old. Uh, he argues that you should do philosophy not through writing, but through carpentry, hence 
uh, carpentry. So I see filmmaking as landscape architecture, carpentry. Um, using filmmaking in this way uh, uh, allowed me to, uh, uh, or helped me to see three things. Uh, it allowed me to examine and explore the atmospheres of agricultural landscapes. It functioned as a methodology that led to a more ecological understanding of these landscapes. And it was a way of uh, eidetic storytelling to actually communicate anthropocenic landscapes in a meaningful way. Uh, given the time of the presentation, I will uh, focus mostly on, on the third point, because uh, I also think it's the most interesting one very shortly. Um, uh, film um, atmospheres in a way to, to giving meaning to uh, a landscape we are in, which we do unconsciously and instantaneously. Um, as the, the discourse around agriculture so much intellectually about techniques, we give meaning very much from, from our thoughts and not so much from the, the synesthetic or the emotive side experience. And I think film can bring that into the larger discourse on agriculture. Uh, filmmaking is also uh, a method that really needs close engagement with the sites. You have to go there a lot to just do your filming. And because of that, you're not a passive distance observer, but you become a participant in the landscape you study, both in the way that you uh, partake and have to traverse the landscape that you're in, uh, but also in that you start interacting with people and things that uh, live on the site. And I think that leads to an understanding in which everything is connected to everything else, and that opposes a bit to the more traditional way of architectural understanding, which is seeing things in layers and sort of understanding aspects separately from one another. Um, then film is eidetic imaging for anthropocenic landscapes. Uh, one of the key points uh, and, uh, I had as a starting point for this project was that I wanted to experiment with uh, techniques of representation as these um, lend identity to a site. Uh, analysis is, isn't merely discovering data that was there a priori, but it's an active act in which we conceptualize our landscapes. Uh, James Corner, the landscape architect, calls this process imaging. He argues that as landscape architects, we focus too much on pictorial techniques and static singular narratives for our imaging, and that this prevents us from giving heterogeneous and open-ended images of landscapes. He argues for the use of eidetic images, which combine different types of information, both sort of the visuals, traditional architectural images, as well as technical um, cognitive, intuitive, uh, and tactile information. And that uh, an eidetic image brings these types of information into juxtaposition and conversation with one another. Um, yeah, as you can see, there was a, a lot of different types of information in the film. I already outlined them during the previous stills, but um, I'll quickly run through these. Um, and I think these eidetic imaging and this different way of imaging landscapes uh, works very well with anthropocenic landscapes. Uh, the anthropologist Niels Buband argues that uh, one of the defining characteristics of anthropocenic landscapes is that it's impossible to distinguish human from non-human forces, um, which means that it's impossible to, in a sort of singular static narrative, um, explain how a landscape came to be or what damaged this, or in a way these landscapes become indecidable. And this sort of narrative of indecidability is something that politicians and especially companies use quite often to avoid financial responsibility to recover um, uh, the landscapes that they have uh, damaged or impacted. Um, Buband argues that a nonlinear narrative allows to move forward with anthropocenic landscapes. Uh, it allows the locals to sort of understand, provide a framework to move and live in these landscapes. And it, and by laying out the different forces that while impossible to separate, still give a pretty good idea of how a landscape came to be, even though you can't sort of say linearly with certainty. Uh, I think eidetic imaging and film as an eidetic image uh, can be an important tool for working with these anthropocenic landscapes. Um, the overall aim of the project was to, to review the spatial and uh, aesthetic and system, 
systemic impacts of uh, agriculture on landscapes of food production. It was uh, in a way an exploration for myself to kind of find a meaningful way for myself as a filmmaker and a designer to work with and improve uh, anthropocenic landscapes. I think film is a very promising tool that designers could use more often and even though this is just a very first uh, foray into working with film in this context, I think there's a lot of promise. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Kone. Um, we will move on to the next one, which is Millicent Gunner. And I hope that we have you with us also. She is not, she was there before, wasn't she? There was another person. Yeah, there were three before. <laughs> Move on. Yeah, should we move on and then switch back maybe to, uh, yeah, okay. So, Tonya, then we invite you uh, to join the table and then we hope that Millicent will um, return back uh, a bit later. Tonya for being here and okay it's okay now can you hear me back there yeah yeah I think so uh, so Tonya has been a, a associate professor of architecture at Humia University Sweden School of Architecture and senior lecturer at the University of West England West of England Bristol School of Architecture she has publications on uneven development and the production of social space, architectural representation, and transdisciplinary approaches to visual and architectural research and design. So thank you, Kanya. So now it's Thank you very you. much, and thank you for inviting me. So um, this is from a visual essay section for this uh, publication, and the idea is that the visual essay will happen and a written essay or a verbal essay uh, will float across it, sometimes aligning with the images, sometimes not. So uh, the first image, um, or all of the images, show part of an archive that um, I've brought along as well. The first iteration of this is in a book called Wide Load. And the first image uh, was of a house in the city of Umeå in northern Sweden. Um, the house was raised up onto low-grade pine stacked timber. It's sight condensed thinking about this as a frontier landscape. So just to pause it before I show the film. The landscape is represented as wilderness in Swedish popular and official culture, a wilderness containing things, timber, iron magnetite, lithium, and low ambient temperatures for the cooling of processing banks for data storage. So it's near to the Arctic Circle. The house seemed to rest lightly on the ground, floating above and containing its own stability and rigidity. The space of the city, traffic and bodies flows between the underside and the ground. The space beneath is wrenched. There is a violence to the land and its garden, but there is a care of moving the house and its domestic space. It has been taken care of by three generations of a family, and its move and the gap are part of this. So there are clear echoes of Matta Clark's architectural work splitting, in that the space comes to represent more, a wider concept. So looking up inside the house from the gap, the furniture remained, the coat hooks, the mirror on the wall, the chandelier wrapped in a bin liner. The domestic space will be transported 10 kilometers to a rural location. A visual record of this allows a minute analysis of this architecture in relation to its social political landscape. What was revealed at the site amidst the process of preparation for moving was the space under the house, the gap between the house and the land. 
It was entrancing and shocking to the outsider to witness the wrenching of an apparently fixed object from its attachment to ground and floating it on air away to somewhere else. A flux of precarious human existence can be understood and considered through images of the process of the house move. It is governed by surrounding things, the timbers, the tools of moving, the pile of foundation stones, the discarded everyday ground, structural debris and more. So the weight of the house is settled onto timber stacks, which are also used as levers for the foundations. They press into the soft ice-melted earth, leaving a temporary trace, and there are 10 kilometers of trace between. This space then has a projectile quality. It travels on the lorry through and out of the city and realigns itself with new, sometimes unplanned situations as spectacle. The architectural contexts are completely reframed by its move, passing by a local fast food outlet over a bridge into and across the garden of a rural house in a narrow road section of its journey, uprooting and smashing the traditional fencing of land divisions in rural northern Sweden. And this on post boxes. The architecture itself has the capacity to explore the real world. This is a distinct form of deterritorialization and re-territorialization, and it's also a particular form of gentrification. And there are fundamental questions about whether the house could have been preserved without this particular economic process and significant increase in land values of the region. So I want to show a short film, and then I want to slow, as the film has already been slowed down, but I then want to slow it down with stills, so I'll can, carry on the reading while showing stills from the film after. But just a short quote from John Berger before I start the film. A friend came to see me in a dream from far away, and I asked in the dream, did you come by photograph or train? All photographs are a form of transport and an expression of absence. No. It's... Documenting the move through photographs, drawings, and video gave focus on material and substantial things. The material of the house, its transformations of parts of domestic interior, the devices and tools used and constructed to carry out the move, and it triggered a delight in the paradox of the translocation of domestic, fragile, lightweight, non-rigid, impermanent things in situ. So this is playing the image of the film back into the interior of the house. What was left behind months after the move were elements of the form of social habitation. Entrance steps, mangled washing line poles, fruit beds, the remnants of an understory, of an archeological display of previous structures, service pipes connecting the site to a wider district and city infrastructure. There was also evident a cycle of nature reclaiming its hold over ground and space in contradistinction to human practices of farming and gardening. The question about the literal state of the land and about what was this land before the farm and house were laid out and built and what the land will be after the house has been moved were laid bare. This area of northern Sweden was a matter of centuries of stewardship by indigenous peoples before white European ideas of territory, production and trade largely displaced these peoples. At one moment, the 70-ton house had the lightness of air. At several atmospheres pressure in the process of lifting the house on inflatable pillows, high enough to drive the trailer under it. The photographs then provide fixity in the transients to record and read the gaps opening up in the city and the gaps filled in the rural context. Photo montage or projection is a dual reading of the transposition of views to articulate the spatial transformation. It considers, for example, looking out of the same window onto and across a new landscape. It returns the house to its original site after the move, not as a nostalgic reconstruction, but as a measure of understanding settlement and its implications. 
Images align to consider how the previous occupant would see, for instance, the 1960s city administrative commune building from the living room. From the window and in its new position, a view across the rural landscape to the industrial Volvo plant, which emerges like a white city. The house is a marker to these reconfigurations. Its instant collage method gives a strong remaindered landscape and multiple opportunities for visual reconfigurations en route. The house move is architectural montage. The process produces a temporary stillness in which to look at a hundred year history of a building in a landscape, but also a three month history of its unsettling and its six hour spatial relocation. This form of representation allows a particular connection with the world the antithesis of the apparent spatial gap. It is a building up and a combination of surface and image. In some ways, it resists the move to make the relocation as a constructive making. The photomontage process interrupts the flow of images, creating a space through which other sets of values about a given architectural condition establish. It sets up a dynamic across surfaces like the project study space itself, projecting the images of the move back into the house as a reciprocal midwinter event considers the context of long hours of darkness of the region, illuminating this domestic space as a marker of settlement and inhabitation. These projections reanimate the house, its interior, and they reimagine the space and its sliding capture across the 10 kilometer terrain against bus stops, global development property advertising campaigns, and IKEA. It repositions views of the landscape through the windows to investigate the city under this process of unsettling. So it was important to use ephemeral media, light projections and digital modeling. Using the projections had two distinct attractive properties. It left unmarked existing buildings, artifacts and surfaces, while being recorded in further digital systems. And it was mobile, fleeting and transitory, and through the actions of projections, realized in a way the strong sense of the flux of this place in society. So some of the projections were as public events out in Umeå. The projection sites included the house interior and exterior at its new location, and key artifacts along the route marking aspects of spatial and social development, propelled by reason to transform places and social order through melting all that is solid into air. Further photographic projections offer layer of discourse to understand the moving house in relation to the demolition of these traditional and 20th century cabins at the rapidly developing fringes of the city and the appropriation of Sami reindeer herding land by the university. What forms of life and settlement do the cabins represent? And what is their attachment to the lake landscapes as a particular form of traditional Swedish recreation and a way of life? It's one of the questions raised by the research. The cabins do not have the heritage value of the historic house. They do not embody the romantic notion of the Swedish North to the same degree, but they contain other heritage and lived experience value. In the words of local resident, Elvi Pearson, no problem to demolish, much harder to build up houses and relations. So a second set of projections occurred two months later to the east of the city, and the area is a historic and 20th century cabins expropriated by Umeå commune to be demolished in line with the policy of urban expansion and densification. This used projections of images of the state of the house in the extended moment prior to its displacement, the process of moving and the state of the space after. And it also used representations of a house in design drawings, maps, and capturing views of the house through software like Google Street View. So there have been three distinct methods of recording and image making in the project. And the first has been this archive of recording the process of moving from the city and out into a rural context. Sorry, I should stay there. 
The second is a series of photo montages which highlights the new views out of the windows and the lost immediate context of surrounding urban space, buildings, and more. And the third is a series of image projections to reinstate the journey, the 10 kilometers, and to consider what such a shift might mean in relation to the wider urban or suburban context. The projections have been onto trees, buildings, bus stops, roads of the move, and the inverse, which is this projection back into the domestic space of the interior. And also through the vertical gap, which you can see on the left here, open between the rooms where the stone fire and the chimney have been removed to make the building lighter. This brings a keen trace of this shift across the domestic surfaces of the interior, wallpapers, radiators, curtains, and more, to unsettle the uniquely collapsed architectural context. So it was captured as a set of unsettling images, and part of this was due to some of the properties of the method, which had the following effects. Bringing together the different space and time through image and surface juxtaposition during the projection, the transparencies of image and surface and the disturbance of appearance in the captured images, and the transitory and fleeting quality of light and illumination and changing the appearance of things and improvisational and brief light interventions responding to the space and the artifacts and light in one or other place. So it made an important link to the use of light in homes uh, in northern Sweden, a practice of cultural importance at this latitude in terms of light and darkness, so inside and outside, with the spectacle of the aurora borealis overhead. It also affected minimal change or transformation of things and places in the production of the artwork. So in conclusion, the space beneath the house exposed prior to its being transported connected the place and object to an idea of reproducing space that was not confined to a particular plot subdivision. This space and the exposure of the ground raised questions about the potential of objects to be unfixed and how one space or another might be figured as sites of settling and undevelopment. In this particular instance, it can be seen that the bringing into light of this space under had exposed a current moment of capitalist speculation in land and housing. The movement of the house was an unsettling event, arising through rupture and dislocation. It raised questions about different models of change for settlement, one perhaps not so directly framed by flows of international capital, supported and negotiated through state interests and policy. In this particular case, it was a model of change that was framed by the caretaking of a building through several generations of occupation, though underpinned by greater economic and political forces. So part of this unsettling was a parallel perception of the area of corporate systems utilizing enormous resources to establish and maintain settlement and its infrastructure to counteract natural forces of erosion and disintegration. The photographs and film stills offer close examination of how global capital moves and consumes the landscape and the politics of that movement of bodies and architectures. The wholesale moving of buildings here can be understood and represented as Gordon Mutter Clark's An Architectural Parade, where the city is dismantled and paraded in its various forms to become Umeo the monumental city with its moving houses and snow piles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya, for this very rich presentation and great images and film. Honestly, uh, we were a bit too fast befo before because we forgot that we actually had a small break. So that's maybe why Millicent was not with us. Be a solution? Yes, that could be a solution. Well, we are actually thinking about nutritional things because we ate, so don't you eat, so, so that you yeah. don't eat too much cookies because so we, we broke the interval. But sorry. <laughs> is that okay that we just move on if Melissa is with us yeah. now? She is? Great. Excellent. Hello, Melissa. Good to see you. I'm sorry that we, uh, we were too fast, I think, jumping over the, the break, and by there, you, we discovered you were not there. 
but so good to see you. Um, I will just make a short introduction to you before we start and you can present. So Millicent Gunner is a PhD candidate at the MI, RMIT University in Australia, exploring an attentive landscape architectural research practice in relation to practices of care. She completed the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture and Design and the Master of Landscape Architecture and, uh, and Landscape Architecture at RMIT University. She has taught at RMIT's Bachelors of Landscape Architecture and Design for the last two years, as well as a semester at the University of Tasmania in the Bachelor of Design. So please, Millicent, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Uh, hopefully that's visible. Sorry. Sorry, I feel <laughs> the the time difference and also that jump ahead has um, confused me a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm calling in from Australia. And before I start this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations culture and community of this country, um, commonly known today as Australia, and pay my respects to the Yatmatang people on whose unceded lands I'm living and practicing on. Um, and this stolen land is colonially known as Mount Beauty. Um, so this visual essay is titled Walking the Table, Caring with Landscape. Um, and it's situated amongst ideas of attentiveness and making with as a practice of care and has arisen out of my PhD research that I'm currently undertaking. So with a background in landscape architecture, I've become interested in exploring photographic methods situated within a landscape architectural practice. Uh, and in this experimental project, I am unpacking the relationality between the camera device, a table on wheels and myself, and how each of these have embodied an experience of the landscape as well as represented it. And I should say this um, project was undertaken within the foothills of the Victorian Alpine National Park um, near Mount Beauty. Drawing on Donna Haraway's ideas within her book, Staying with the Trouble, I am adopting a similar notion of making with that she talks about, um, making with others as a practice of care, um, but I've changed it slightly to caring with. Um, by caring with, I mean being consciously present and attentive to the landscape oneself is in, to listen to and become informed by the landscape. Caring with is also situated in relation to Tim Ingold's ideas around thinking through making. In allowing oneself to be vulnerable and open, one can harness unconstrained and improvised movement in response to or influenced by where one is moving and who one is moving with. So the process or methods of my practice research are focused on caring with the landscape through companionship or partnership and correspondences um, occurring between myself, the camera, the table and the landscape. Building a table with pneumatic wheels to push around the site as a mobile drawing desk enabled an unexpected relationship with the landscape revealed by the absurdity of walking a table around the site. Um, these moving images depict the shadow transept captured by the table and camera when being pushed. The jolting, unsmooth movement of this video is similar to the table being pushed over the gravel and dirt ground surface I was walking over at the time. 
Um, I'm now going to read a small text narration that sits in partnership with the shadow photographs um, in the visual essay. Activated through pushing and shifting the table around the site, the pneumatic wheels respond to the ground conditions. As the wheels turn, the hex nuts become loose on the bolts. The washers spin and rattle. I bend down and tighten them again. The shadows are indifferent to their temporal host, merely a projection of what is growing out of the ground below the radiant sun and above me, the table and the camera. Ephemeral are the shadows as the table moves along the transect. Permanent are the shadows on these pages captured by the camera. Standing on the tips of my toes, maneuvering my body as to not interfere with the shadows above, I point the camera down and press the shutter. Improvisation and absurdity revealed the table and the camera together to be an experimental device, registering the site's temporal shifts and phenomena. Both the camera and, and walking the table act as a device that enables one to enter into a conversation with the landscape provoking a consciousness of details and processes that are occurring. Photography shows, but the very act of framing also takes away, removes and abstracts. This quote is taken from a book called Active Landscape Photography by landscape architect Anne Godfrey, um, who, was undertaken, who has undertaken research into critical practices in photography in relation to landscape architecture. This idea of photography both showing but at the same time abstracting um, speaks to how these photographs from walking the table encapsulates an interaction between the camera, the table, landscape, my body and time without the visibility of these actions or devices. This abstract method of capturing the shadows on the table's horizontal surface provides insight into the phenomena of the landscape at that specific moment in time, as well as my body's connection to the camera and table as I stretch over and tilt the camera lens down towards the table's surface. This photographic series captures the process of a dialogue emerging between uh, me, the walker, and the landscape, facilitated through the two devices, being the camera and the table. There are two layers of the image being produced, where the table being pushed through the landscape is hosting the interaction between the surface on the table, the sunlight and the landscape's matter above, um, producing its own image through shadow forms. Uh, there's then me, the human, and the camera. Together, we're making images of these shadows. Um, and so there's these photographs are a set of relationships unseen in the images themselves. Another photographer and landscape architect, uh, Anne Wiston Spurn, speaks of photography being a device to notice and discover what cannot be seen directly or only at a different scale, to question, seek answers and find connections among what is seemingly unrelated. These photographs are telling of a clear sunny day with vegetation loaded, located above me and the table and the camera, their shadows being a reminder to look up notice and pay attention. Intertwined with movements of the table, the landscape and my body's experience in the landscape, the photographs have allowed a shadow transect of a temporal site to be engaged with and prompt questions of larger timescales. Um, I'm going to read another section of the text narration from the visual essay. Growing from the earth's ground, stretching upwards towards the light and sky, slightly leaning over the embankment's edge towards the lake. Shapes in the shadows share characteristics and habits of the endemic and introduced species. 
Noticing an unusual, sh an unusual shadow of a tree branch, I looked up. What we humans botanically classify as an almost species had strange growths on its smaller branches. Unknown to me whether the tree has wing bark disease or is a cork winged elm, after this discovery and unsure whether the elm is sick or not, each time I passed by, I would check on the tree. Through attentiveness, noticing and participation, this engagement and partnership with the devices and the landscape is a practice of care that opens up space for others and otherness to reveal themselves and an invitation for myself as a human participant to be present, uncomfortable at times, and to quote Donna Haraway, to move along with unfinished configurations of, of places, times, matters, and meanings. This shadow image here is from a eucalyptus tree, a tree with hundreds of subspecies endemic to Australia. It wasn't until I passed under this eucalyptus tree to then um, this shadow appearing on the table that made me pause and look up. The unfamiliar looking tree branches were of an elm tree, an introduced tree species to Australia um, this one having crept out of the nearby village where I was walking. The, the tempo and pace between the ground conditions, the table being pushed and the shadows on the surface engaged in attention to certain details I would have otherwise missed. The shadows communicated with the devices and unlocked an otherness of sight, expanding my um, my perception and immersion within the landscape and opened up a dialogue and opportunity for responsiveness. Though the images distill um, the shadows at a certain moment in time, the series also represents a part of the process within my practice of caring with that is being physically present and consciously attentive to the landscape. Tim Ingold reflects in his book Correspondences that care has lost much of its spontaneity. It is less personal, less imbued with feeling. It has become a service to be delivered rather than a recognition in attention and response of what we owe to others for our own existence as beings in a world. Working with these devices together in partnership the camera and the table have allowed the opportunity for spontaneous encounters and draws one's attention to notice others present in the landscape. Working with the camera and table in the landscape have both been participatory and sensorial experiences of being in the landscape as well as being devices to communicate or represent those experiences and findings within the landscape. Um, and that's it from me, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Millicent. Uh, I just wanna try maybe to extract some, some key aspects and then we will have the, the key uh, discussion. Uh, Tonya might want to join up here, and we have Shiro and Kone and Millicent uh, present. Um, when we started this panel, I also introduced that processes uh, is the theme, and I think it's interesting that all your presentations show some, of course, issues of processes going on uh, at a specific site at the same time as you all work with processes that happens in between the use of tools, different types of media, film versus photography. What is striking is some of the words that also have been said, something about that what cannot be seen directly, that which appears unexpected, or projections like in Tonya that, that can then reveal uh, aspects that have happened uh, which we did not see but might can learn from. I think some of these uh, notions are, 
are going across your presentations and are intriguing uh, to maybe discuss further on and where the, the medium used plays a, a, a big role in that. Well, I can probably start with, uh, well, with the last presentation because I, um, with Millicent, uh, I would like to just to ask you one, um, one question because um, in the images that you have shown um, and you talk about uh, landscape and particularly the, the Australian landscape, um, in what way can we see the specificity of these landscapes? W would your work be different if you did it in another place or the, um, the process, the setup, the, the table um, would be what would we see different from what we've seen? What would be different if you change places, if you change to another country? Your, muted. your mic it yeah. is muted. Yeah. You're muted. OK. okay I think we are uh, taking care of it. Yeah. It's done. No, no, it's not. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, when I speak about specificity uh, within the site that I was moving through, it was more related to, it sits within a bigger body of work, I guess. So that's, it's sort of pulled out of that. But um, I'm speaking about the shadows themselves and those images of moving from the native plants, which are, I guess is quite difficult to understand if you're just looking at the shadow images, but um, that's coming from my own experience of moving through that site. And then the contrast of um, introduced tree species popping up, which I am able to identify. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I meant by specificity. So if I was moving the table around somewhere else, um, say in a different country, the ref like the shadow reflections would be um, slightly different or not slightly, quite like very different depending on where it's moving. Um, and I think also by specificity, I was talking about um, like time and space where at that moment in time, it was a sunny day. And so it would be a very different result if the weather was different or um, even if I was, I didn't mention putting the paper on the table. And I think that is probably quite a major factor as well with the um, being able to capture the shadows. So if I was to use different materials or um, push the table, over a different surface that would also adjust like what is being captured. Um, I don't know if that answers the question that well, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there might be interesting aspects in terms of uh, that what was said that what appears that was unexpected. I think Kone uh, has some sort of uh, focus on that. You maybe did not say it directly now in your presentation, but in your paper you have this notion of, of some of the plants that you suddenly discover in your film, uh, maybe not while you were filming uh, on site, doing field work, but coming back, realizing that those vegetations actually tells you about that there's this slippage of nutrition coming from the greenhouses. And that can't be seen as similar to some of the issues with the red dust. Uh, or it's also maybe in terms of Tanya's work, uh, some of those projections that suddenly show unexpected things. But Kone, would you, would you like maybe to elaborate a little bit upon those experiences of returning with your material um, and those unexpected aspects that then becomes like the next move with the way that you are montaging your film or, or editing uh, the film.
It is also muted, uh, so we need to have Kone unmuted, and maybe also Shiro unmuted, both of them. Yes, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, so what you're referring to is that I think I briefly mentioned it in, in the presentation. So one of the, the ways in which you could notice that these horticultural systems aren't so close is the fact that a lot of the planting is uh, kind of invasive species that sort of thrive on uh, the abundance of nutrients and they, they uh, um, uh, they sort of overtake everything else. And um, it wasn't when I was there initially on the site that I noticed these so much, but it was indeed more during the editing. So I think there's a certain power in, in film in that uh, it doesn't necessarily annotate, like you do have power over your annotations in the way that you frame and where you point your camera and how you point it, but you're in a way you're notating more than you're initially aware of. And it's through through the editing process, which is I see a bit as a conversation with yourself as well. You you do kind of still learn about the landscape that you're in. Um, yeah, so I think what was interesting is that up until that point, I was also quite struggling with finding my narrative. So actually finding this small piece of like just noticing some plants actually did bring the story together quite a lot as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Tonya, I was curious also with the projections on site, and we also had Julia's presentation uh, earlier today with the H Tower in Rio, using projections to somehow uh, re-enter into uh, attention to what, what has been or will become. Would you maybe elaborate on your experiences with the projections on site or, and in site? Yeah. <laughs> I noticed, also, I noticed also that uh, Julia had said uh, that you wanted to leave the, the space untouched. So it's this idea that you might return to it uh, and add a layer or take away a layer, in fact, with this idea of projection or to make a new space inside. So uh, one ambition was to make domestic this uh, external landscape somehow or to re-domesticate it. Uh, and to the inverse also to start to use it as a comment on the wider uh, conditions there and of the rapid changes in the city. So the idea that many of the traditional, uh, particularly timber, but also other concrete and brick buildings are being moved out of the city. Uh, and also in relation to Corona, which is a nearby city where the whole city is being displaced. But this is over a, a slow process so the idea that it might illuminate that and to draw in uh, people as an event also to start to comment on that. Uh, and again, I think someone spoke about that earlier in the uh, presentations, the idea that it's important to uh, speak to people locally and to, to replay that and to start to address these uh, subjects about, uh, for instance, uneven development or ideas about uh, new forms of gentrification. Uh, and the idea that, in fact, there a whole city can be displaced one building at a time uh, in this densification program. Well, a whole city can be displaced or constructed in the middle of the desert, like, <laughs> like Brasilia. Um, and, and actually, uh, how do you see, Ciro, uh, how do you see the dust um, what what do you I have think do, do you see dust as as being something like because I'm thinking about the pavilion where we're going afterwards uh, uh, and it has some moss at some points humidity stains um, how do you see the dust in that particular place well it's a it's the the center of of uh, Brazilian political life uh, so there are probably other things that stain the city that much. <laughs> uh, well, now a little bit less, but if two or three years ago, it was a, a more complicated context. Uh, how do you see dust in the context of, of, um, um, of, of the buildings, of the, of the constructions? Uh, thank you very much for your, for your question. 
for sure there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of dust happening and smoke and other things uh, lately um, so I think that the I mean the dust is it still exists I mean when you go to Brasilia um, they have to wash the buildings every day you see people sweeping the floors all the time um, so the dust is still a characteristic of the it became a characteristic of the environment and it's interesting to say that the the idea of the desert was constructed I mean it was not a desert um, so the image of the dust constructed this idea of the desert a man-made desert actually that was a uh, somehow was uh, created and um, I think it's very interesting because the dust when you when I visited this city I could experience this dust in the environment and uh, as soon as I went to the archives I mean of course dust archives I mean it's also and and then you could see that the images that were most of them were published in black and white uh, were actually in color um, so, so then you somehow I think, I think it relates a bit with the Cordner's presentation that somehow it's almost an image of this Anthropocene on the making, uh, I think. Um, so it's kind of this, I mean, Brasilia was a construction, but at the same time destruction. It has these two aspects um, that was happening. And uh, yeah, so that does somehow becomes this side, side effect of, uh, of modernity going to this frontier, you know, so comes the bulldozers, comes the photographers and start this, the whole thing, so. Well, I'm also a bit curious what your reflections are in terms of the role of film, because I think that's also very clear, of course, in, in your uh, entry that that shift from black and white photography into the, the color film that comes at that time. So would you just say a little bit about what your reflections are in terms of film media? Yeah, sure, thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, the construction of Brasilia was around uh, the 50s, uh, end of 50s, um, and it's by the end of the 50s that this film is being popularized, which is the ectachrome, which is a, it's a different method than the Kodachrome. It's a more like it's a film that you can develop very easily uh, to color. So they could suddenly, the photographers could develop the film on site. So actually people going to all these very far places, which was this kind of photojournalism, uh, uh, I mean, they, they worked like that, going to places to report, and so then they they could develop this film very easily, and they could they didn't have to send it by airplane before. I mean, in Brazil, you had to send to to the United States to develop by plane. So then suddenly they could start using this film, uh, which was a technology still being developed, so it was not accurate at all. So the red is very red. The greens are very greens, uh, and that's why the architects all hated color film for a long time. So it took like uh, it took around end of the 70s for architects to acknowledge that. So Niemeyer, for instance, he doesn't use any color film, and the ma magazines and most of these um, uh, architectural publications don't use. And sometimes, I mean, still architects, some of architects today also don't like i mean they prefer black and white for you know to be more accurate and you know because the the processing is quite different from both um and these photojournalists were experimenting with this because um magazines were very interested uh with this method and and for them it was easier to to do so um it's part of these other ways of um producing producing images Thank you. I think we would like to now open for all the people in the room, if you have any comments. Yes, Hugh, please. Uh, I don't know where, yeah, that's the microphone. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to say the most dreaded phrase in a conference, which is, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, but more of a comment, but maybe it is, I was struck in Millicent's talk, and I'm sure I've seen images of the, the, her table in the landscape. I think they're part of the, 
publication, but you didn't. I was struck that you didn't show the 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 table making its way because when you see, you, you, I mean, you just feel the awkwardness of it. I guess the difficulty of and and the sort of ungainliness and slightly comic idea of this table making its way across a very difficult landscape. And then uh, Tanya has the word unsettling in her in her title and in the project. And it struck me that actually across maybe all of the presentations, there's this interest in an unsettling of the medium or like making it awkward and ungainly again, letting the dust in, uh, enjoying the gap between the building and the ground, enjoying the the sort of difficulties presented by the table and that maybe that that's all, and maybe even just this idea of that trying to make film of new sorts of agricultural processes which are closed, hidden, not really available to view. So it feels like that there's a shared interest in like drawing attention to a presumption of transparency maybe between the, the apparatus, the, the, the person operating the apparatus, the apparatus and the subject matter. And that in each instance there's you were brought back to the fact of the awkwardness uh, of that apparatus, even even now with phones and everything being so easy, or there's an enjoyment of that awkwardness. So um, I guess that is a question. I just wonder if that if it feels like that that might be something that interests um, uh, some of the speakers. Do anyone want to comment, Connie or Millicent or Shaw on that? I could make a comment, Octonia, do you? I'm happy to say something to that, which is um, for this for the um, project in northern Sweden, there was an idea of uh, the normal of this moving of houses that seemed quite extraordinary. And yet people were, um, it was also a spectacle. So it was, it was during the pandemic and there was no one around and then suddenly everyone came out to see this this spectacle, but it's also normalized there. You know, it's, oh, somebody's moving a house. And then more and more, there was an idea when I met people that somebody would say, oh yes, this house was moved, but maybe just five meters or something. So the idea that everything's uh, slipping around somehow and is unfixed, maybe comes back to the table, this idea that it's, it's just slipping around. <laughs> and photography and film, gives the, the potential to, uh, to look at that slippage, sometimes to fix it and sometimes to, to unfix it. Do you mind if I? Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering whether as a comment and maybe a further reflection that could maybe bring it back to more of the presenters, um, whether the use of, of tools and this apparatus that in a way make a filmmaker, um, in a way, you intensify maybe your own relationship with the site that you are actually working with via the tool. Uh, maybe that is linked with sensorial aspects, coming back to Connie talking about synesthetic relationships or, or properties uh, of site-human relationship in order to become attentive. So that is also kind of a self uh, observation method to, to create that kind of care and attentiveness, uh, empathy maybe with, with the site you work with, which is linked to maybe sensorial aspects of filming or doing field work. Do, do you mind if I add something? I'm sorry, Corne. Oh, no, okay, okay, you go, you go, I, I'll go after. No. You go, you go, please. Sorry. You can unmute it. You can unmute it yourself. No. I, I think. They can't no, unmute. they can't. They can't unmute. So someone needs to unmute them. Or. Yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sorry to. Uh, to, to interrupt. Uh, no, I was, I was just struck by what you said, Rick, in that 
I think my, my interest in film in, in general started from this sort of the bringing in of a sensory experience into, into design and into architecture, because I, I do think that's something that's lacking a little bit. But I, I think throughout projects, I think there is something about how film as a medium maybe reflects more how we think, or it has more the capacity to actually sort of encompass a thought, because I don't think they are like our headspace isn't as linear as it usually comes out when we when we present it as a narrative let's say and i, I think there is something about how i wonder if it really is like in in a way it's personal right in a way you bring yourself into the landscape and film does that but in a way it's also just a different way in which a thought is presented and that it's something that develops from parts more and that happens a bit haphazardly and it goes all directions and in the end it's sort of clear like I don't know. I think that's something that was also part of I think all the presentations here that it's it's just a different way of developing a narrative and a question and sort of answering a, a pre-established narrative not with in the same language but finding a, a language that actually suits the critique of the, the the narrative that we don't agree with or that we question somehow. So in a way, it's images and film as thinking tools and thinking images that also affect others thinking so that double double uh, yeah affecting and being affected okay uh, let me just yeah. let me yeah. just stress something because it's 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 interesting the um, the antagonism that exists between the brutality of the things that are being done and the brutality of those movements moving a house or constructing um, uh, big, um, how do you call it, the plastic things, uh, the, um, the agricultural things, I forgot the name, the, uh, the, the greenhouses, uh, things that actually brutally and, and in a very intense way change the landscape of things, but yet your approach is a very, and all of you, Cornelius, Millicent, and you, Tonya, is very, a very gentle approach uh, that contradicts, because I see, when I saw your presentation, and you, 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 you mentioned uh, Matt, uh, Gordon Matta-Clark, uh, Matt well, that would be a playground for him, I believe, probably. <laughs> so, do, do you ever feel that, that, that tendency to, to try and uh, do things in a more not so gentle way or it's that's the only way that's the way that you think that you can uh, I don't know kind of raise awareness uh, probably uh, to the I think there's an idea in film um, in its relation to architecture which is about occupying the space um, which is very different again to say architectural photography it necessarily, I mean, uh, there are elements of that, but the time base uh, introduces uh, occupation. And yes, um, the intention for the project was first to document it in this way, but then, uh, so there's, I want to make a documentary of the underneath, uh, but also to make a model of that and to uh, take it through the city to have exchanges about that. So I think I need to understand it properly before that happens, because I think it's quite a, perhaps a less gentle approach to do that, because it's another form of intervention. But I think to understand it first, you have to um, occupy the space. And I, it, that's what I see in the other presenters. They're occupying it over time, yeah. Should we end the panel here with occupation, meaning that we need to occupy, we need to, uh, yeah, <laughs> fill up a, a space? Uh, I don't know if it's shouldn't we? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were thinking on finishing now? No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's before I say something. May, maybe uh, yes, but maybe I. I I comment something and then, uh, because I'm gonna, it's too early, to half past five, so I'm going to propose uh, also a new, <laughs> a 
a new visit. So we visit the faculty. We have a site visit and a research center with me, of course, and all of you. And then at half past five, we go to the exhibition because maybe some people are just coming here to at half past five. So we have the exhibition at, the, at that time. And um, well, uh, well, my, my greetings to, to all the authors. <laughs> and uh, I, I was well, maybe uh, starting thought of start with the quote of the, that uh, American philosopher that Gordon Streetman uh, told that uh, applying non-traditional methods uh, allow us to have new insights. And then I was thinking on all the, well, all the different works and interventions since uh, this morning. And uh, I thought on this idea of uh, Alan Rouet, he's a theoretical, uh, <clears throat> theoretical author, uh, thinking about image and photography. And he was said that uh, image photography was uh, most important as a, a way to confront reality and not to document it so much. And uh, I really think that that is something common in all the works that we have seen with different visual strategies, more unconventional, less unconventional, but they are always, and that, that's something that was told here, they are always an abstraction of reality. They are not trying to uh, mimic reality, but what they are trying to do is for us to speak about it, to discuss it, to explore it, and, and of course to have new insights. And, and so I ask, uh, is not the uh, image photography, it's an autonomy territory. That's the most important thing. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not the referent, it's not what's happening, but it's, it's really a way of uh, seeing uh, reality in a different way and we are discussing and creating new ideas and new experiences. And well, it's a, it's a statement, but it's a question also to, that I'm asking to every author and, of course, to my colleagues in the table. Thank you. Okay, can you comment? Uh, do you wish to comment, Corneille or, or Millicent or Cyril? Or not. Let's Sorry, I was a bit distracted by uh, a chat message that I got, so maybe one of you can... Uh... <laughs> Shouldn't we then uh, make an applause and say thank you? <laughs> Presentations and for joining, and Millicent, it's late in Australia <laughs> right now, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was fantastic to see your presentations. So thank you so much. Thank you all, and, and thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you to the audience. And thank you, Rika. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>